My name is Dariusz Wolski and you're listening to Cinepart. The following podcast contains explicit language. You're listening to the Cinematography Podcast presented by Hot Rod Cameras, a program about the art, craft and philosophy of the moving image and the people who make it happen. Coming to you from the world headquarters of Hot Rod Cameras in Hollywood, California, are your hosts, Ben Rock and Ilya Friedman. Hey, Ben. How's it going? It's going great, Ilya. How are you doing? I just got my first vaccine like a few hours ago as we're sitting here and uh thus far no side effects have hit me but i'm i have been warned which is pretty funny considering i'd say the the amount of times you've blinked in the last 30 seconds tells me you look very sleepy i've heard that sleepiness is a side effect of of getting the the vaccine sleepiness is just also a side effect of what time we do the host wraps so uh (laughs) it is after 10 p.m you're right it is late yeah no uh, i just got it i got moderna about five and a half hours ago and uh, I again, I have been warned that if you already had COVID, as I did, and you get the first shot, uh, sometimes the first shot operates the way the second shot operates for some people in, in that you, you can have uh, two days of COVID-like symptoms. But still, uh, if it means that eventually I can uh, go uh, watch a movie in a movie theater or uh, eventually feel comfortable eating in a restaurant or something or being around other people and uh, collaborating on projects as we do. It's worth it. Also, the benefit of not catching it later and dying. That, that's a big benefit. That's true. Yeah, that's, that's a, little side, a little side hustle I'm working on is not dying of COVID. Well, hey, theaters are back open, though, at least in L.A. That just happened. Some theaters are, although uh, like Arclight and some of the other, the, the bigger chains aren't. Uh, Cinemark is open. And it's weird mm. because like I'm even like at this point, what movies are in theaters? Like I, I've completely lost the thread of like. What does a movie mean now, you know, after watching all of the Snyder cut of Justice League on HBO Max? Like, what what is anything? What is time? I don't understand what it all is anymore. Like, I need all of culture recontextualized for me now. Well, Thank I, you, COVID. I, I, I can help you. Uh, this weekend, box office, the number one movie was Raya and the Last Dragon, which uh, you can also watch at home. But but that was number one. It, it, yeah. made, it made five million at the box office, followed by Tom and Jerry, which made three point eight million. And uh, there you go. <laughs> yeah, I know that Godzilla versus Kong or Kong versus Godzilla. That's that's going to be one of our next. That's that's like the first big tent pole that will be going uh, live in movie theaters, but also on HBO Max the same day. So uh, we'll, we'll see how that goes. Directed by horror legend Adam Wingard, mm. who kind of cut his teeth making amazing horror movies before making the third Blair Witch movie, which I uh, didn't do him any favors necessarily, but apparently did not stop his ascent as uh, as a tentpole level filmmaker. So hats off to you, Adam. I, I'm, I'm a huge fan of your work. Hey, let's dive into close focus. I know uh, there's a couple of things that I think are particularly noteworthy for our, our listeners that are worth going to do. In fact, uh, you could go do it right now if you only want to take a minute if you are not in your car and listening to this podcast. But, uh, but Ben, I know you just watched the trailer for the Academy Award nominated best short documentary, Do Not Split. Tell me what your immediate reaction is after watching that trailer. I mean, it, my I think that I literally just said, holy fuck, like it's about a giant movement in Hong Kong to not be absorbed into mainland China governmentally and societally and in every other way that it could be, even though Hong Kong, I believe since 1997, has been controlled by China. Um, it's two different systems, and it has been certainly more democratic in its uh, government. But it's but- basically because of China's largesse. Like Hong Kong was kind of cohabitated by China and the UK and in 1997 it basically went back to China but they you know they knew that they couldn't just scrape out all of the cultural trappings of living in uh, sort of a democratic state so China kind of said like you're going to be autonomous but you're part of China I, I don't quite understand exactly. Well, uh, there, there was a new security bill that basically went into effect, and it's gotten very little coverage so far here in, in the U.S., but this really kind of drops the, you know, the viewer into these protests. And I'm, I'm really pleased to see now that you can actually watch the entire documentary, which I believe debuted actually at Sundance. Uh, you can watch the entire thing on Vimeo, and we will put a link to it in the show notes. It's 35 minutes long, and it looks sort of like a harrowing white-knuckle ride inside of the uh, protest. Yeah. But the reason we're, we're bringing this up is that China has expressed anger 
anger over this movie being nominated for best short documentary. And I think that's really interesting because they get uh, they get bent out of shape all the time over things, especially related to censorship and regarding, Mm -hmm. you know, the perception of uh, of the country sort of like in the world. And they've actually gone gone out now and said that there might be retribution for our award show nominating and possibly awarding awards to certain movies that they find more than a little controversial. Uh, just actually this past week, Chloe Zhao found herself in, in hot water for comments that she made 10 years ago, published in Filmmaker Magazine, where she felt that, you know, China was filled with lies. She is Chinese. She lived there till she was 14, and then she went away to boarding school and then moved to the United States. And, you know, she's got a profile that's starting to, to be on the rise there now that she's been nominated for Best Director of a, for a future for film. For Nomadland. Exactly, for Nomadland. And there's a bit of worry amongst sort of the corporate overlords who, <laughs> Disney in particular, who've hired Chloe to direct a new Marvel film, a new tentpole movie called Eternals, which has got yeah. Angelina Jolie and a bunch of other people in it. So, you know, Nomadland hasn't gone to the theaters yet in China. And and it probably won't. I mean, <laughs> prob- probably <laughs> they, won't now. But I mean, yeah. Eternals. They only let in a certain number of American films anyway, like that's kind of their their thing. But as you know, one of the burgeoning markets in the most populous country in the world, if I'm not mistaken, you are, uh, you, are correct. you know, they basically represent an enormous amount of money if you're making a giant tentpole movie like literally all the Marvel movies. So if you hired a director that displeased the Chinese leadership and they decided not to program your film, you could be walking away from potentially hundreds of millions of dollars. I don't actually I don't I don't know exactly how much money because I don't know how much money the average American movie makes in China. It would be worth finding out. But certainly it's quite a bit. I bet it is north of 100 million dollars. Yeah, it, it could be a lot for sure. Even though ticket prices are lower there, there's a lot of people seeing a lot of movies. So that money yeah. goes a long way. I always thought it was uh, interesting because our friend uh, Ed Sanchez made a movie in Hong Kong called Seventh Moon years ago that involved ghosts. And because of Chinese law, uh, they could not call them ghosts. They had what? to they had to be demons or something. <laughs> and so they kind of just landed on pale figures. And uh, and I say this as a flaming atheist. Apparently in Chinese, uh, the Chinese culture is so atheistic that that is why they're not allowed to portray ghosts at all. This is what was explained to me by our friend Matt Compton, who produced that movie. They're not allowed to show ghosts because that implies a life after death. And, and uh, as an atheist, I'm totally <laughs> cool with ghost movies. I'm cool with anything movies. You know, just because it's in a movie doesn't mean that we're saying it's a real thing. But hey, you go super weird about it, China. Who who cares? You're, it, it, it's your own country. Well, wow. well, I'm sure it's only going to come to a, a come to a simmer as the awards get closer here, and uh, we'll all see what happens. Hey, uh, Ben, who's on the show today? This is an amazing get. Thanks a million to our producer, Alana Cody, for making this happen. It is Darius Wolski, who is just a legendary cinematographer. uh, One of the people whose work in the 80s and 90s was just unbelievably pioneering and then uh, immediately copied by everybody. You know, he shot (laughs) stuff like uh, The Crow and Dark City. But I mean, he's he's done so much stuff and he's uh, got the current movie News of the World, which is a movie that I don't think is getting enough love. I think it's a beautiful amazing well done movie you know it stars tom hanks and it's directed by paul greengrass and it's like everything about it is is just edge of your seat well crafted drama suspense and it's gorgeous 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 to look at of course because darius walski is uh one of our finest living cinematographers uh, yes, indeed. And actually, my, my pick for cinematography from our uh, our upcoming episode, I'm not going to spoil it, but yeah, I'm going to spoil it. It's, but you uh, just spoiled it. Yeah. Jesus Christ. OK, then then then, I, then I'm, I've spoiled it. I, I, I pick News of the World. I think News of the World. It's what I think Academy voters will go for. So so I've gone official and I've, I've ruined that episode by my. Well, you've only pick. ruined your part of it because it's still uh, Janelle Riley and myself with well, our predictions. That, well, I guess that's true. And we do make a couple of other predictions. But yes, I, I'm going to call it right now. Mank might be the front runner, but I'm, I think News of the World is going to appeal to the Academy voters. I think Academy voters are going to uh, award some love to, to Qu- Wolski. Quite possibly. Yeah. But regardless of whether it wins awards or not, uh, definitely, uh, if you're listening to this, check out News of the World. Gorgeous film from Paul Greengrass and Darius Wolski, you know, both working at the top of their game in my opinion all right so ben let's get to the uh let's get to the interview with uh, darius walski the cinematography podcast interview 
So we are here transcontinentally speaking in Rome to Darius Volsky. Holy crap. One of the DPs that uh, Ilya and I have been wanting to get on here for a very, very long time. I've been a giant fan of your work. I think some of your, uh, a lot of your work is transformative and, and became the stuff that everyone else copied. So thank you so much for uh, making some time to come on here. Thank you. Thank you. Before we even get going, we, we want to talk about News of the World, your new film with Paul Greengrass, which is amazing and gorgeous. But uh, Ilya wanted to talk to you a little bit about how the two of you met uh, years ago. Yeah, uh, we, we met like 2008 on what turned out to be the last movie ever shot on the, the Dalsa camera system. So, uh, and it happened right, like literally when the decision was made from our corporate overlords in Canada that, well, because we were going to close Dalsa, because, you know, we had this pending merger with another company that didn't happen, but uh, it was, it was a bad decision the way that they decided to close it. But they said, oh, someone go over and just repossess all the, the equipment from the, the Tim Burton movie. Just go over there in a van and say, excuse me, excuse me, everybody, we're taking back all of our equipment. Oh my God! And, uh, yeah, that's story. That's a good one. Yeah. But thankfully, uh, <laughs> thankfully, cooler heads prevailed. Of course, that did not happen. But like that, yanking was... the camera out of your hand while you're setting up a shot, <laughs> it's like, oh, excuse me, pardon me, Tim Burton, we're taking this back now. <laughs> my version, my version of story of the story was uh, this was my first digital movie, so I was thrown into it, horrified, absolutely horrified, <laughs> to the point that that last minute in London, I called Tim. I said, Tim. I can't do this. Let's just shoot the opening scene and the end scene in film. And we completely change equipment and opening scene before she goes into the hall and the end scene when she comes out of the hall. It's just still shot in film. And of course, inside the hall, we had to shoot digital because of the nature of everything being on blue screen and characters being cartoon, you know, animated and so forth and so forth. And because Tim's brilliant idea about enlarging the Helena Bonham Carter's head to, up, to achieve it, and because of changing of the sizes of people, we had to shoot 4K. And that's why I knocked at the door and opened. There was the only 4K camera. Dolce was the only 4K camera at the time. But did not have any way to resolve the image. Image was like basically looking through Ectochrome. And one of your buddies who was a very good salesperson was telling me the world how brilliant this camera is. And I said, listen, but I can't see what it does. Oh, it doesn't matter. It's going to be fine. And I did tell him, listen, man, if you're going to do the business like this, you're going to go out of business. And sure, while we were shooting, you guys went out of business. So it was very prophetic. I was very angry, but yeah. Oh, man, that's it, awful. It was the biggest unknown ever. It was just completely huge, wild guess what we were doing on this film. Yeah. And the whole 3D. Yeah. and then <laughs> That's true. That's right. There was the 3D component of the whole thing. Partially responsible for the, for the whole 3D nightmare. I mean, James Cameron is number one, of course, <laughs> after Avatar made billions of dollars, then Alice made a billion too. So there was like no question, everything had to be 3D from that on. It, it, it definitely was a was a very interesting time. And boy, I remember the 3D craze. Everyone said, oh, it's going to stick around forever this time. And I remember 3D <laughs> televisions, they were, Panasonic was trying to sell you t TVs, you'd sit around with 3D glasses on in your living room. I was Oof. in a pub in England looking at this research, they're doing homework, watching the 3D football game, European soccer. So it's like, if there's a goal shot, it's beautiful 3D, but you know, when they pass the ball to the right side, then it's just too far away. This 3D doesn't do any, yeah. any good, so they have to just cut into the long lens. It's just complete nonsense. Anyway. Well, uh, let's go ahead and talk about News of the World, which was just released. Gorgeous film uh, directed by the legendary Paul Greengrass and shot by you. And I actually felt like watching it, both you and Greengrass, I don't know that you have a, a style that I would like look at a movie and immediately know it was it was your work, but I feel like Greengrass obviously does. There's that multiple cameras, all on zoom lenses kind of look that I associate with Captain Phillips and, uh, you know, obviously the Bourne movies and stuff like that, and United 93. And this movie is very, very different for him. Now, when he reached out to you, was he already kind of on the path of, of making a film that felt a little bit less multi-camera than a lot of his stuff? Or did you shoot it multi-camera the same way and it just cut a different way? I, 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 I as, as the end viewer have no way of knowing that uh, it was still multi-camera i wasn't we used two cameras which mm -hmm. is for me it's not really multi-camera but yeah it is yeah. yeah 
but in the same time, I do respect his handheld approach to movie, and the movie is handheld. The movie is static, I'm handheld. It's just basically it's very toned down. It's not it's not handheld for sake of handheld. It's basically handheld just to create this little bit of uh, you know just to make a film a little bit more realistic and more intimate. You know, there's a comp- this movie is a combination of like you know documentary style, but also I would I call it well-observed documentary, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I feel that I always shoot documentary, you know. When oh, I really? Did Dark C- yeah, when I did Dark City, I put sodium vapor lights on the stage. So that's documentary because I saw sodium vapor lights on, on the street. Huh. So that's, my approach is always just, just to take, take reality and, and interpret it. So this is, that's what I call documentary. When I work move, do, do movies with Ridley, I think a lot of it, what we do is documentary. We stage the scene, we put four cameras and we try to capture it. I totally see that with Ridley Scott stuff for sure. You, you know, it's like when you, I keep saying is when you look at great, great reportage photographers, I mean, they're in war zones, they're in difficult places, they're poverty stricken places, you know, like when you look at Salgado or even when you look at like great New York photographers, mm-hmm. when you look at live photographers, you know, it's what do you call it? It's a documentary. They go out there with the camera, right? They always manage to find a great composition, a great light great frame, great composition, great body language of the characters they photograph. And so, I mean, that's for me, a documentary, you know? So yeah. my movies are like documentary. It's just, you create an environment, you light it, you do it. And you always have in the back of your mind, what, even if you shoot a blue screen, you always think about what it would look like if there was no blue screen. Oh, uh, for sure. For sure. Um, but it does. I, I mean, I agree that it, it does almost feel like we're making a documentary in the Wild West. Not not exactly like that, but it, it feels like we've dropped cameras into real environments and, and the lighting feels, for the most part, very naturalistic. And, and what was the approach on this movie specifically to kind of finding the lighting and finding the look of, of those uh, environments? Because also there's a lot of very, very dark stuff, a lot of night scenes in the movie. Well, I mean, when it comes to take serious, it's basically having your compass and knowing when the sun comes up, when the sun goes, sun goes down, and then yeah. coordinating coordinating it with with production, with with the first AD. And but at the same time, like you know, we have this habit of shooting everything backlit, but there's a lot of front light there too. Just, yeah. I mean, thank God we were shooting in November, so the sun is pretty low, so even front light looked nice, and and desert just photographs it so beautifully. Yeah, so. Just being completely open to what nature gives you and just trying to capture the best way. Trying not to control it. I mean, I've never I didn't use any lights outside during the day. Oh really? I never do anyway. I never do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just I think it's cheating. I mean it's what <laughs> sometimes you have to because you're stuck and you have to match yeah. something, but sun's going down. <laughs> I find it I just just it's just not fair to to nature, you know. And it was kind of your first Western, although, you know, I guess maybe one could argue that the Mexican has Western tropes in it, <laughs> but uh, it, it, it was it was the first like straight up Western you've ever done, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. I mean, horses. What is Western? You know, just you shoot it in the Wild West and, and have horses and guys in hats, right? That's, that's, that's Western. <laughs> well, I was curious because like there were moments in it that felt like they referenced, you know, like the searchers or some, you know, some of the classic yeah, of, Westerns. Of, of course, you just put, you know, if you have a beautiful vista, you put, you know, actors in the, in the landscape. And mm-hmm. it, I guess that's a Western, yeah. Sun is going down, beautiful low light. Yeah, that's a Western. <laughs> Campfire, that's a Western, yeah. So, did, I mean, did uh, the two of you study any specific Westerns for references or were you trying to make up your own cinematic language for it? You know, like everyone was referring to Searchers, but, you know, I've watched it myself. It's, it's you know, it's beautiful, but it's kind of, it's dated. You know, you of can course. see that. I mean, I've watched modern Westerns. I, I, I watched The Assassination of Jesse James because it's Roger, you know, he did a beautiful job there, you know. But we never like sat down and watched the movie together. Um, I'd I'd love to go back because looking back at at your career, like I I real I I sort of feel like my late teens were kind of raised by you. Like I, all all the music videos that you shot, you oh know, you, you I mean, really, uh, 
I mean, because like I was in high school in the in the late eighties, so I I was unknowingly watching your work uh, constantly on MTV, and you were uh, you know one of the pioneering DPs in the music video craze. You came in and started shooting some of you know like the Bangles, Eternal Flame, and uh, the Traveling Wilburys. Uh, like, let me just jump in and say music. that this is actually the the heyday for music videos. I think music videos hit their peak right about this era. I mean, my name is Luca, uh, Luca, you know, uh, Suzanne Vega. Oh my God. That, and that, that won a video music award. I mean, this, this is like, this, this is, is when what MTV did. was no, really, did. yeah, it did. It, it didn't want best female artists. Yeah. I, I mean, That's I, I, quite a sweet, sweet story about Luca because it was, it was one of my early videos. Of course, there was a lot of animation there, but it was again, handhold black and white, just, but it's still, for, there was this, this wonderful man, a still photographer and, we had quite a few chats and whatever. And then time, time moves on. A few years later, Harris Savitas, I'm having dinner with Harris. And she says, we've uh-huh. met. It's like, what do you mean we've met? Yes, we've met. I was a still photographer on, on, on Luca, you know. Oh, wow. And then we became great friends and, you know, extremely influential cinematographers. I mean, rest in peace. I mean, he was very, very important because I come still from a generation that was definitely trying to be like, you know, a lot of backlight and smoke and stuff. And, and Harris is the first one to start shooting like, okay, no backlight, forget about this, you know. And let's just don't make everything contrasty and crushy like we're all trying to make everything contrasty. And he was the first one who started pulling the negative and making everything soft and very, very, very special. I don't know, I'm just digressing because- No, no, you it's, it's, we love it. It was this whole crowd of like David Fincher, you know, Alex Proyas, Julian Temple early to, you know, everyone yeah. was just pushing, pushing, pushing. And but we all wanted to be filmmakers. We all, we all wanted to make movies. We were embarrassed to be the videos, but there was the only thing given to us. So, we, yeah. It's always interesting to hear that because, it, you know, I mean, like as a kid, I was obsessed with movies as well, but also like I was peeled to MTV every day and I loved, you know, the experimentation and, and you would see like an experiment show up in, in a music video and then suddenly it would be in commercials or then it would be in movies and, you know, the style, like we, I feel like we don't have that now. We still have music videos, obviously, but I feel like we don't have like this uh this laboratory of creating new cinematic ideas and styles that then trickles up TV, to the other stuff. tv is it streaming television is it now for sure when i look at when i look at young kids amazing work we were this generation yeah that we music videos put us into advertising because advertisers want to ask because we were representing something yeah. new and then eventually you know got us to movies yeah that was that was a great great time yeah well, what what brought you into music videos in the first place? Like, what what was the? How did I'm you get, into- to get the job? I'm trying to get the job. <laughs> <laughs> no, because I was in. I came to New York. I was working as a crew, camera assistant, bit of gaffing, bit of this. Started operating some low budget movies, did some like art movies that no one ever saw, you know. Mm-hmm. And I came to Los Angeles, and I just got lucky, met two people, and started doing music videos and. I think what happened is with our generation that we were trained filmmakers. We were we were trained filmmakers. We wanted to make a movies and music video was the only thing that they hired us to do, you know. So we were always trying to make, you know, more cohesive frames, longer shots, you know, more interesting lighting, still within the chaos of rock video, you know, 14 hour day and whatever. Yeah. But trying to kind of organize everything, kind of make it more, you know, cinematic and you know and david fincher was the same thing he just came he came from ilm he was a he was a camera assistant and cameraman and for visual effects you know and yeah yeah very young and he was very specific very well organized very kind of visionary so and, and alex proyas was the same thing film school very you know so we were just trying to make something classy out of videos and you know and and so your relationship with Alex Price obviously uh, blossomed in, into the feature world. And on your IMDb, I don't know which one was shot first, but like your, uh, I think the first feature you have on there is uh, Romeo is bleeding. But then the next year was The Crow, which was I think the the first thing of yours that ever completely blew my mind wide open. I was a projectionist in college, and I would just sit there and watch The Crow over and over and over again. Oh, like so I, I, I studied it. Well, I I feel. 
like you and Alex Price kind of locked on to kind of a you you took a music video aesthetic into a full feature in a way that I I had never seen it done before. And it's a very stylized movie and I've watched it I I think I watched it maybe about a year ago and I feel like it really really holds up and you know outside of you know the obvious tragedy of what happened to Brandon Lee on that shoot that movie like it, it just has such a such a strong look and I feel like when I saw it it announced both you and Alex Proyas as like kind of a new a new look a, kind of a, a force to be reckoned with and I feel like a lot of movies copied the look that the two of you guys uh, created on that what was it like being like on the ground and, and kind of creating that look as you were going? Well, the, the, the good thing was that we were doing lots of videos, lots of commercials. So everything was a rehearsal for the crowd. Yeah. Now everybody knows if you're successful in commercials, you know, Michael Bay's and, and, and Zack Snyder's, all this generation yeah. came after us because, I mean, I don't want to say, we kind of broke the ice. We've proven yeah. that the kid who does music videos can deliver the movie. Before, when I was when I was doing Romeo's Bleeding, the biggest argument from the producers was, okay, his commercials are great. If it's a million dollars for 30 seconds, so, you know, what kind of budget does he need for the movie? And yeah. That was the argument to me, you know, as a cinematographer, you know. It was like a big no-no, you know, because this guy is like, doesn't know how to make films. <laughs> uh, but thank God I did this because the same uh, completion bomb people on the crow, so I was greenlit, you know, because it was hard. It was very hard for us to break into film. And I don't know if there's anything that you can say that hasn't already been said about the the tragedy with Brandon Lee, but if you're willing to talk about it, I'd love to hear how did everyone approach finishing the film after that, you know, horrible onset accident happened? It was just, it was like getting up on the horse after it seriously fell. I mean, you know, after the incident, everyone was just ready to just basically scrap yeah. the film, forget it. Just, you just went home, you were hiding and, 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 uh, but then Alex, I mean, Alex said that if his family wants him to finish the film, he will. That's that was our incentive. That his mother wanted him to wanted us to finish the film. So that was, I mean, of course, Ed Pressman and all these people wanted to do this film too because they had a big investment and financial yeah. reasons. But but the the ultimate decision was if the mother wants to finish the film, we will, and we did it. Yeah. It was hard. It was hard going back. It was really hard going back. How much of the film still needed to be made after after that? Um, like how many more? How much more shooting do you recall? I don't exactly remember, but quite a bit, quite a bit. And there was a lot of kind of early face re- replacement, poor man's Ferris replacement situations when we shot. Thank God the movie was very dark, so we could get away with it. Yeah, like there's moments when he walks in from another scene and basically. There's a big lightning, and on the lightning, we we impose his face, you know, a couple times. You know, we use a couple of those tricks, you know. Well, and, and you've worked with Alex Price on on several of his films, and uh, one that Ilya and I both wanted to really talk about as well is Dark City, which you know is just such a an amazing film. And earlier in the interview, you were saying that you you had a documentary approach to it, and like again, I, as a fan of The Crow, when I went to see Dark City, I, I I was expecting what I got, which was like striking compositions and and just some of the most gorgeous lighting and just best art direction, everything about that movie just really artistically, you know, coheres. And it's all, a lot of it's a reference to Metropolis, Fritz Lang's Metropolis, if I'm not mistaken, or there's, there's, there's a, a lot, lot of, yeah, to a lot of things. Yeah. Metropolis, the, the whole, like the whole German expression is we all very much. In- so tell me how, how you square the circle of German expressionism and documentary, your documentary <laughs> aesthetic. Oh God, I don't know. <laughs> I'm trying to, <laughs> because you know, although you get less less stylus, you, 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 it's getting a little bit more gentle with your approach to photography. And mm-hmm. When you're young, you so you just want to just basically every movie is the the movie you're gonna make. Like you're never yeah. gonna make another movie again. You know, that's that's your approach when you're young when you're starting out. But using sodium vapor lights, you know, on the stage, that was my idea. And uh, because I did something before with sodium vapor lights and there was like early days and they were like really orange kind of monochrome. I gave you this very eerie color. And, and that's what we did on Dark City, just put them on stage. So so audience subliminally can see the like the actually then reality they're kind of familiar with. 
Mm. Because if you go on the street, it's a real. And the same thing with, with like, you know, the diner, fluorescent lights, everything was green. In those days, everyone used to color correct fluorescent tubes. Street fluorescent tube was green at the time. But either blue-green, cold, or warm-green. And, uh, of course, when you came on the set, you used to replace all the tubes with the proper tubes of a tungsten on daylight because you want to be proper by the book, you know. And that's I just threw all this away. You know, everybody is shooting now with sodium vapors and green, but but I purposely brought the lights from the street and put them on the stage. If you have a great production designer, you put the camera anywhere and you have a great composition. Oh, that's... If you have a bad, bad production designer, you keep struggling to find an angle. <laughs> it still doesn't work. Well, it's something that I used to ask a lot was I, w- I would ask DPs when they were reading the script if they saw it in composition or if they saw it in lighting. And I eventually kind of retired that question because I, I, don't, I don't think it's... You know, you create an environment, you create a space that you can tell the story, you know, and yeah. then if this space, when you look at locations, the same thing, you just walk a location, it just doesn't speak to you. And then mm-hmm. you walk in the place and it's like, oh, this is great. You immediately see three good angles and then, you know, this is going to be a place you're going to be working, you know, and it becomes pretty instinctual. But a lot of it's just designing sets, designing sets and uh, building lights inside the sets so that you can shoot wide, you know. For me, composition frame is more important than lighting. People are so preoccupied with putting lights so the lighting can be perfect, but they put so many lights that they can have a big white shot because yeah. this, so I'd much rather, you know, show the ceiling than put the light in the ceiling. You know? So I, I want to talk about your multiple collaborations with Gore Verbinski, which I don't know if you worked with him in commercials, but uh, I, the first one that I know of is the Mexican and then obviously the Pirates of the Caribbean movies, which which are enormous. But uh, how did the two of you uh, fall into each other's orbits? We knew each other from early music video days. So we just like became friends. That's what happened, you know, like, and there was like this instant creative input out of him, you know. Then we parted away. I started doing music commercials, music move my movies, and, and then Gore asked me to do to do Mouse Hunt, but I couldn't because I was just finishing Dark City. I was tired, blah, 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 mm-hmm. blah. And then I stopped making films because I was just raising my kid and I was just focusing. So I was like really selective and stuff. And then Gore called me up, hey, this is this 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 small movie, you know, you want to do it. Maybe Brad Pitt is in it. I said, yeah, sure. Everybody says Brad Pitt is in it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so we met had a cup of coffee and then we met mexican and uh, and then after i did the mexican with him i was doing something for bruckheimer i don't remember what movie and bruckheimer comes up to me he says what do you think about this guy gore verbinski is he any good i said oh yeah he's good <laughs> what about you <laughs> some next thing you know he was off with the pirates no it's great it, it created you know one of the most lucrative uh franchises I think in film history and that first one, you know, it's, it was just such a surprise surprise. all the way around top to bottom from the way it looked, from the way that it incorporated the visual effects from the, you know, like those movies were kind of pioneering the second one too, with the Davy Jones character and the integration of the visual effects that were, we'd never seen anything like that, you know, but like when you first went on to pirates of the Caribbean, what were your thoughts about? Cause pirate movies at that point too, were notorious for flopping in Hollywood. No, that that was that was our, we were against the biggest stigma ever. Every pirate movie was a disaster. Doing everything against all odds. But you know, it's Johnny's character, complete anti-hero, which yeah. is, was new, new at the time. This was now everyone caught up with it. Now everyone, now every prestigious actor knows that it's okay to be funny and and make a lot of money. But at that time, it was cutting edge, and Johnny was not a movie star. He was, he was a great actor, but he was not like in eyes of the studios, which he was not remarkable. And Tim Burton told me later, it's like, he said to me, anytime I mentioned Johnny's name in front of the studio, there was like long faces. And oh, after yeah. Pirates, I'm still afraid to mention his name and everyone says, oh, it's okay. <laughs> so, so, oh, that's <laughs> <a different." laughs> I sort of want to start wrapping up here in, in a few minutes, but I feel like it's impossible not to talk about the Prometheus uh, films that you've done and, and the Martian. And how do you work with VFX supervisors or how do you kind of integrate the VFX stuff that's going to happen later into your work on set? Constantly talk about it. Constantly. Mm-hmm. Constantly talk about it with them, telling them what I'm doing. I think it's just them being on the set and constantly discussing things, how we're going to do it together, basically, you know. Mm-hmm. 
what I'm going to give them, what they're going to give me. You know, they help me out, I help them out. You know, that's that's what it is. You know, sometimes you know, it's verbal. No, no, no emails. I still. Yeah. <laughs> Well, and especially your work with uh, Ridley Scott, Prometheus, and The Martian, and Raised by Wolves, they somehow managed to fuse, and again, after talking to you, I, I understand that this is something you're going for, but it, it's a science fiction-y thing that feels like I could walk right into it. It feels like a real world. It doesn't It doesn't feel so hyper-stylized, and it, it, it doesn't feel removed from reality, if that makes sense. They all, they all feel very grounded. You take everything from reality, you know, you take, you know, like, yeah. I love those movies with real locations and real content. That's just such a such a joy because you can just photograph everything you see. You know? Yeah, you don't have to put those screens and stuff. You know. Awesome. Well, before we get going, uh, I, I mean, I, I feel got like one question before go before for you like, go for it. Okay. So, also on your IMDb right now, your announce is attached to an untitled Keith Richards documentary. I was looking through your filmography, and you've got tons of stuff that's shot in documentary style. Is this is this truly a documentary? Uh, uh, to be clear, uh, this is a documentary that we shot that Johnny Depp directed about oh, wow. Keith Richards, and we got, we did this like ten, I don't know how many years ago. Everything we shot this quite a long time ago, and uh, the movie is still it's just not out yet. I mean, there's still this. I think there's some some legal issues between between Johnny's camp and Keith's camp, but you know, they're, they're great friends, and and it was an incredible experience, and. Uh, I hope this film is going to be shown somewhere because it's very personal. Uh, Johnny talking to, with Keith, you know, about Keith's whole life. Yeah. So before we go, is there uh, any place online where people? I mean, obviously, people can uh, tune into literally any uh, cable network or streaming service. Uh, they can watch Raised by Wolves on HBO Max. There's any number of places to see your work. But do you have a website that you uh, like people to uh, go to to maybe interact with you? Instagram, any of that stuff? Mm, my agency runs my Instagram. Oh, okay. It's called Darius Volsky Official. That's it. Yeah. No, and I feel like you're one of those people where it's like, if, if people want to see your work, it's everywhere and you've already seen so much of it. You know, there's a million miles. No, in. I mean, this is pretty good. This pretty good. This uh, Instagram thing is pretty extensive because they show this a lot of stills and stuff. Yeah. Cool. I, I, I'm looking at it right now. It looks really good. Yeah, it looks great. I started doing this thing that I think I'm going to just do more is I take a lot of photographs from the monitor now. So it has kind of a bit of skew, has a monitor, in it, but from, from, from the set, of course, I can't publish them until the film comes out. But yeah. there's a few of them, there's a few of them on, on my Instagram from News of the World. We'll encourage our, our listeners to check out uh, your Instagram. And again, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's a real pleasure to meet you. And uh, obviously, uh, Ilya and Absolutely. I are both enormous fans of your work. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Darius. That was great. So that was Darius Wolski. Just I love hearing his uh, his insights on on his career, and I, I feel like his work has definitely uh, contoured the insides of my brain about like what makes amazing cinematography. Uh, you know, because I was basically in film school while The Crow and Dark City and some of that stuff was was hitting theaters, and uh, I I just love his work. And now short ends. Ilya, it is now our time for our world-famous, award-winning chili bowl of short ends. Do you have a pet obsession of the week? I do. Panasonic this past week actually kind of surprised some people by announcing that they're now going to have a raw recording format built into their camera. It still requires an external recorder, but they're going to have this format built into their camera that now when you combine it with a certain external recorder... That format is made by a competitor. So they've taken Blackmagic's B-RAW format, so RAW video, RAW raw data, RAW 4K, and, and other resolutions, higher resolutions, and now have shoved that inside of a firmware update that comes out at the end of this month for like four or five of their cameras. And that's... Really? Yeah, well, I mean, I should say, maybe I should clarify that it's it's two cameras, I think, or three cameras for sure that are getting this. Well, a couple of them have like a paid upgrade, but others it's it's included automatically. And then they have other features that are coming as part of this this whole thing. But yes, uh, the, the flagship camera, the S1H, also the BGH1, which is this little box camera, are getting this really incredible raw format upgrade, which if you're not familiar with Blackmagic RAW, it's inside of all of the Blackmagic cameras and it works natively with DaVinci Resolve and it's really really easy for most uh, 
you know, modern computers to work with. So here it is. But uh, Panasonic has said, we, you know, we're going to take this other format, which works really well, and we're going to put it inside of our cameras. And now you can use these pretty inexpensive Blackmagic recorders and get B-RAW. It's a it's a really interesting uh, approach. And I'd heard Blackmagic say that they were opening it up to anyone who wanted to to do this, who wanted to be able to record this uh you know, interesting. Yeah, this this visually lossless. It's it's still highly compressed, but visually lossless is is the way they're putting it. And that that is lossy, of course. But it's how much compression can they possibly squeeze on there? And of course, Red has you know made visually lossless uh, as a uh, and and ProRes uh, RAW. There's these other formats out there have made you know no bones about the that compressing down these images to smaller file sizes and keeping as much visual acuity as much as much of the original detail as there as possible uh, that that's kind of the whole name of the game that's what this is all about and uh panasonic uh i think it's pretty cool that they they took this on i don't think that people who love panasonic cameras are suddenly gonna you know get a taste of b-raw and go ah now i'm jumping ship and going over to black magic but who knows i mean they are they are sort of apples and oranges type of thing uh black magic makes really fine cameras too incredibly you know cameras that directly compete with 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 panasonics but uh, i'm pleased to actually see this sort of collaboration because the i think the products and the product lines are different enough but now you can have sort of like the seamless workflow and if black magic really wants to go with this it wouldn't surprise me at all if we start to see other companies copy panasonic's move to get more compatible with davinci resolve and get more people working in the the b-raw space we'll, we'll see what happens but uh i'm cautiously optimistic about the future of this and i think it's a good move on panasonic's part i mean uh i i don't want to take us down too much of a tech rabbit hole but is there an advantage to b-raw over say apple prores i think the main advantage of Blackmagic RAW over like Apple ProRes RAW is the file sizes. You you literally mm-hmm. are getting, uh, I think, three times the amount of space, three times the amount. Uh, like, oh, interesting. Yeah. So you get three times more stuff fitting in there with with Blackmagic RAW, at least in the, the 12 to 1 versus sort of the ProRes RAW, which gives you uh, only, I think, two options and uh, they take up way, way, way more space. So it is a more. What about uh, like if you're if you're doing like green screen, like what's the color space of uh, Black Magic Raw? I I couldn't tell you off the the top of my head the color space because the color space is going to be encoded by the camera, but it is a uh, it is a twelve bit format, so it's a twelve bit recording. Okay. So you got lots. So and lots so of if you were if you were doing compositing and stuff, it would it would work for all that stuff. Yes, very much so. Interesting. Well, it's neat to have all these gizmos now that uh, you know. Hopefully, soonish we'll be out in the world doing stuff the way we used to and. By soonish, I mean two months to a year. <laughs> we'll, we'll, life will be back to something resembling normal. And you know, Black Magic. I, I have to say, like the first time I saw their their camera at NAB, I believe you were with me when they had their very first camera. And I, I kind of got into a, an argument with the. I, I have a, a bad habit of getting into arguments with. You love uh, getting into people, to arguments with people at their at their trade show booths. <laughs> at, at, at NAB, yeah. and I remember like the guy at the JVC booth, like all but kicking me out of it once. Uh, when yeah, he had, he had uh, no patience the, for you. You were like, "This looks like yeah, shit," yeah. and he was had. I had, <laughs> I had no patience for his crap ass camera. That's why. Um, and with uh, Black Magic, which you know, like the the quality of that camera, I thought was really good. But they the form factor of their original camera was a little nutty, and the fact that it didn't have a battery, and their whole attitude was like, "Oh, don't worry, manufacturers will come up with battery solutions for us." It's like, oh, okay, so tack on however many more hundreds of dollars to your asking price for this until I can actually use it. Uh, that being said, I've shot stuff on Black Magic. I think it looks great. I don't, you know, I'm not, I'm not here to slag on back Black Magic, and I think that they have. Over, I mean, it's been probably like seven or eight years since then, and I feel like their cameras and everything have gotten better and better and better, and obviously Resolve. It's not an idea that might come to its fruition one day. Resolve is a fully functioning uh, NLE that lots of people use, and you can learn for free. This, you can download it, and you yeah, and it's it for free. free, and you can you can use it for free. the The free version does a lot of stuff, and I don't use it all the time, but a lot of times if I'm doing a project where I need to get my project out to uh to someone else to color uh to to grade it i will bring it over from premiere where i'm editing into resolve just because that way i can make sure that all my stuff came in properly and they don't they're not gonna have to replace any of my shots or anything uh you know th- uh, this was really originally supposed to be my my short end to talk about how black magic raw is now instead of a panasonic camera but i gotta give huge props to black magic for their pocket cinema camera 6k pro which is the latest version of their their 6k cinema camera uh it's 2500 bucks and it's incredible is it a perfect camera no 
Is it incredible for 2,500 bucks? Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to do a lot more sort of stuff, I think, with the Pocket 6K and YouTube and stuff coming up here in the near, near future. And let me just quickly then plug our YouTube channel, too, because, of course, uh, Ben Katz is doing a great job putting old episodes and new episodes of this podcast on YouTube. So if you enjoy digesting podcasts via YouTube, you can go to our Cinematography Podcast channel yeah, and you can find all of our, our, you know, way more of Ilya and Ben than you uh, than you than you bargain for there. <laughs> load up load up your your virtual uh shopping cart with all the alien ben you can stomach hey uh sounds gr- <laughs> sounds gross isn't really that gross ben um, what's your short end what, what's going on with you uh, what, what's your obsession my, my short end is uh there's uh I, i've been meaning to kind of give them a plug for a long time there's another youtube channel called video revealed hosted by an editor named colin smith and he basically he's he's got a great bunch of it's mostly premiere or adobe centric so if you're not into adobe don't waste your time but he goes into into deep dives about how to do very specific things within premiere he has a few products that he sells on his website like if you needed a title crawl he's got like you know for like 20 bucks he's got like all these crawls you can buy but i have to say that just like Whenever he drops a new video, I as soon as it pops up in my YouTube feed, I immediately watch it because even though uh, some of the stuff he does isn't stuff that I need all the time because he's doing stuff that feels a lot more corporate, but he gives like tips and tricks and workarounds and he, he's somebody who like, I think he worked with the Coen brothers, like he's he's just been around forever and he's just really, really smart and w- opens my mind to stuff I didn't even realize Premiere could do and I've been using Premiere now for about 10 years. Hmm. It's weird to think I've been using Premiere now longer than I use Final Cut Pro, Apple's Final Cut Pro because I used that for about nine years and I've been uh, on this for 10 now and uh, anyway it's what's cool about programs like Premiere but also just the entire Adobe suite is how deep all of the individual applications are and he kind of digs into a lot of them and he's not working for Adobe so like when he when he finds a bug he'll explain to you yeah you're not crazy when that happens to you that's a bug and there are bugs all over I mean pretty much any software that's that complex there's you're going to hit bugs uh but it it always makes me feel a little better as someone who uses uh, Adobe Premiere like constantly that I'm not crazy or being a bad editor because I can't figure you know when I do certain things it doesn't work right it's because that's a glitch within the software but definitely if you're into doing anything with uh, within the Adobe suite. And I'd say at any level of user, again, I've been using uh, Premiere professionally for, for uh, 11 years now, or 10 years now. I think that y- you owe it to yourself to kind of go through it and, and kind of see a few of the, the videos that he has. They're short, they're digestible, they're relatively entertaining, they're pretty cool. So uh, video revealed with Colin Smith, check it out. Nice. I, I will totally check that out. I uh, thankfully don't have to do editing all that often, but when I do, and I ever have to do something like a lower third or a title crawl, I always find myself like scratching my head for a few minutes. <laughs> it's like, wait, it's like, how do I do well, that? Well, you again? know, yeah, you can always call me. You know, you could just call me. Oh, but. okay. <laughs> I will totally do that then next time. Yeah. You you open well, up the floodgates. Rap- it's gonna happen. <laughs> Uh, text first. Oh, okay. Uh, so I, I think I think that wraps this up, though. Who do we need to thank this week? Uh, let's thank Alana Cody. Why not? Let's thank her. You know, first time. We'll thank her. Yeah, thanks, Alana. Can I just say, like, how much I kind of shit my pants when she said Darius Wolski was going to do the show? Yeah. I was just unbelievably <laughs> excited to talk to him. Um, let's thank Kays. Let's thank him. Why not? Let's thank him. Thanks, Kays Alatracci. Everyone check out www.musicbykays.com, and you can hear some of Kays' amazing work. And uh, it probably links to all of his other websites that show you uh, his CGI, his color correction, uh, his directing work. Holy crap. We're one day. We're all just we're actually we're all just working for K's right now. And we don't know it. Yeah, hey, yeah absolutely. And uh, of course, uh, not least at all. Ben Katz. Let's thank Ben. Holy Katz. crap. Ben Katz. Hardest working man on this show yeah, by and, far. And I certainly I had some major goofs this time. So thanks, Ben Katz, for, for not including those goofs and making me sound like a fool. I don't care if you used my goose, Ben Katz. I don't care if I sound like a fool. <laughs> fool me up. Anyway, Ilya, where can people find you online? Uh, find me over at Hot Red Cameras, hotredcameras.com. Most of the socials is just at Ilya Friedman. That's that's me. So you can so find smart. me those. So much smarter than what I did. Well, why is, why is that? Oh, well, I mean, just because all of my socials have like 
stupid different uh, things, different names. Uh, you can find me at benrockonline.com. That's benrockonline. And on there, you can find all my socials. Find me on Facebook or Twitter, or LinkedIn, whatever whatever floats your boat. Yeah, I recently uh, joined Clubhouse. Uh, I have not added that to my website. I actually haven't really partaken in very much Clubhouse yet, but I, I keep wanting to. Every time I tune into it, it just sounds like a TED Talk being given by some average person. Apropos of nothing, but did you hear that Trump announced today that he is forming his own social network? I didn't hear that. No, no. Well, he can go fuck himself. <laughs> well, uh, he might. He uh, He's taking his ball and going home. So uh, I guess the people who are big Trump supporters go, we'll all get to go to his network now. Well, you know, the, the good thing about that is like when he was on Twitter, we can monitor the crazy shit that he's saying. But unlike being on Twitter, I don't have to read anything he says on Twitter. Uh, you know, uh, uh, unlike you he does not have a twitter account anymore so he doesn't he's was yeah he yeah. doesn't doesn't have one of those rightfully so my my life is his you know i i uh, not to even get into this but i i remember when he was president thinking like i just want to argue with people about movies and i feel like he's not on twitter anymore and uh non-stop for the last week i've been hearing people argue about the snyder cut and i was like that's the stuff that's what i wanted <laughs> glad, glad to see that return glad to see the uh it was so so <laughs> even more i mean i like the snyder cut but even more entertaining than the snyder cut is just hearing people bitch about you know like, ah four by three aspect ratio oh god <laughs> it's so much fun wow i yeah i i watched it for 11 minutes i i didn't get to keep going back. i watched it for the full four hours damn damn yeah well and <laughs> and i liked a, i liked it more than i didn't like it wow okay. i was very impressed well maybe, yeah. maybe i'll maybe i'll try and go back you know hey uh you know completely unrelated to this uh, i just went and saw you know i was fans of the original spider-man and even the reboot spider-man but i have to say that uh, i like the new tom holland spider-man so i think now the best i just got done watching homecoming and i think it's probably the best one and now i've started far from home so i don't know Have i haven't you, seen far from home yet but i did see homecoming i i think they're i think they're really the some of the best uh marvel superhero movies ever and i think they get yeah short shrift because they they weren't made under under disney they were made between marvel and sony so i think it's you know, it's interesting huh. Yeah. No, I'm 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 down with them. Anyway, we could just talk movies for like another six hours. Yeah, I think it'll be I think it'll be fun for the the people who are still listening to the tail end of this conversation, going like, is this really what their conversations are like? Yep, that's exactly like yep, this. That's exactly what it is. <laughs> well, let's cut it off there, Ilya, and we will, uh, dear listeners, if you're still with us, uh, we will see you next week at the Cinematography Podcast. Thanks for listening. This has been the Cinematography Podcast, presented by Hot Rod Cameras. Find your next camera, lens, or accessory on the web at hotrodcameras.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our show on iTunes and connect with us on Facebook and Twitter. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.